on World News Tonight. Khan to be freed? Pakistan Supreme Court declares that the arrest of Imran Khan is illegal. Will he be freed? Find out tonight. No threat. The WHO declares monkeypox or mpox as not a global health emergency anymore. New chief. Elon Musk has hinted of a new CEO for Twitter, but this time with a major shakeup. Sandy Art. Sand sculptures fill Alexandria Beach in festival prompting tourism. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers and you are watching World News Tonight. And we start off here again in our northwestern neighbor, Pakistan. Pakistan Supreme Court declared the arrest of former Prime Minister Imran Khan invalid two days after his detention sparked deadly clashes and huge protests nationwide. Celebrations after Pakistan's top court deems that the arrest and detention of former Prime Minister Imran Khan was invalid following an appeal by his party. After 48 hours in custody, the former cricket star has been taken into the protection of the Supreme Court, pending release. Khan was arrested whilst in a courtroom on Tuesday, sparking nationwide protests. Clashes with police have killed just under a dozen people since, and over 2,000 people have been arrested. Khan was ousted in April last year when he lost the support of the country's powerful military but remains extremely popular and the chief opposition figure. The 70-year-old is facing a slew of charges including allegations of corruption. Khan has said the counts are politically motivated and intended to stop him from running for re-election later this year. For now, Khan is no longer in police custody but under the protection of the security forces until he can return home. When that will be isn't clear. Moving on to the world of healthcare, the World Health Organization has declared that Mpox is no longer a global health emergency. The decision comes 10 months after the viral disease was given emergency status and at a time when COVID-19 is also waning. The World Health Organization declared MPOX, formerly known as monkeypox, a public health emergency of international concern in July of 2022, reconfirming that status in November and again as recently as February. However, on Thursday, the WHO's Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus declared an end to the disease's 10-month-long emergency status based on recommendations from the organization's emergency committee. More than 87,000 MPOX cases have been confirmed globally, including 140 deaths, in the period between January 2022 and April 2023. And in the past three months, almost 90% fewer MPOX cases were reported compared to the previous 90 days. Yesterday, the Emergency Committee for MPOX met and recommended to me that the multi-country outbreak of MPOX no longer represents a public health emergency of international concern. I have accepted that advice and I'm pleased to declare that the MPOX is no longer a global health emergency. The recent figures suggest that MPOX is under control. Nicola Lowe, vice chair of the WHO's Emergency Committee on MPOX, said that the number of cases is falling but transmission continues to circulate. But the disease needs strategic management in the long term rather than relying on emergency measures. The viral disease spreads through direct contact with bodily fluids and causes flu-like symptoms and pus-filled skin lesions. And cases were reported in more than 100 countries. The transition now means response and preparedness to tackle the disease will be moved to disease surveillance programs at a national level, as is the case for diseases like HIV. Starting from cluster infections among religious groups to mask shortage crisis and even to shutdown of private gatherings, the COVID-19 pandemic was brought evident changes to our daily lives. However, how exactly has this changed our day-to-day -day lives? Take a look. Three years and four months. That's how long it took for South Korea to practically declare an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. Back in January 2020, COVID-19 first hit Korean shores when a Chinese woman who entered the country from Wuhan first tested positive. From that point, it took only a month before the virus spread to the point it was a national emergency. We decided to raise the national crisis level to red from the current orange. 
This was sparked by a massive cluster infection from the Shincheonji religious group near the Daegu area. I'm so distressed by this. I bore to you an apology. The virus was spreading rapidly across many other parts of the world, too, prompting the World Health Organization to declare the official start of a pandemic. It led countries to deploy social distancing measures, delay weddings and other once-in-a-lifetime celebrations with no end in sight. At this point, people could only rely on face masks for protection, but at first, there weren't enough of them. They're all sold out. Masks are so scarce now that you could say someone with no money, but with masks is well off. The government stepped up and deployed a mask rationing system that allowed each person to only buy two masks a week to prevent hoarding. As the situation spiraled out of control, the nation watched on as its frontline medical workers made noble sacrifices. It's tough, but what else can we do but hope for everyone to recover soon and go on? But the back-and-forth cluster infections from religious groups and late-night entertainment venues continued, prompting health authorities to impose stricter social distancing measures in mid-2021, allowing no more than two people to meet after 6 p.m. Even so, COVID-19 continued to take many lives by mutating into different variants from the original Alpha to Delta and to more transmissible Omicron. But vaccines evolved as well and the population gradually gained immunity. Now some three years later and the government is set to declare COVID-19 endemic, lifting the majority of quarantine restrictions from June, people in South Korea will be able to return to their normal pre-pandemic lives. The IMF warns that a U.S. default would cause very serious repercussions for the global economy. And with U.S. Congress unable to strike an agreement on a debt ceiling, President Joe Biden could attend the G7 summit in Hiroshima virtually or not at all. According to the International Monetary Fund on Thursday, a potential U.S. default caused by the failure to raise its debt ceiling would have very serious repercussions for the country's economy as well as the global economy. Speaking at a news briefing, IMF spokesperson Julie Kozak warned that authorities need to stay vigilant on new vulnerabilities in the U.S. banking sector due to likely higher borrowing costs. She added that higher interest would also bring about broader instability in the global economy. A similar warning was issued by U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who said a default on U.S. payments could come as early as June 1st if Congress fails to raise the borrowing cap. And a U.S. default would mean much more than just further instability in the global economy. A default would threaten the gains that we've worked so hard to make over the past few years in our pandemic recovery. And it would spark a global downturn that would set us back much further. It would also risk undermining U.S. global economic leadership and raise questions about our ability to defend our national security interests. In response to a possible U.S. default, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon said his company has convened a weekly war room. He added that war room sessions will become more frequent, potentially several times a day, as June 1st approaches. Dimon also warned that a potential default would spark panic among investors in the U.S. and will trickle into the global stock markets. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden on Wednesday hinted that he may attend the upcoming G7 summit in Hiroshima, Japan virtually or not go at all, depending on the course of his negotiations with congressional leaders on the debt ceiling. His comments came a day after talks with congressional leaders failed to produce a breakthrough. While Biden said he's still committed to attending the gathering of the seven major economies, the debt issue remains the single most important thing on the agenda at the moment for the U.S. leader. Elon Musk has said that he has found a new CEO for Twitter. The current head of the social media platform made the announcement in a tweet. He did not reveal the new CEO's identity, saying only that she will start in the next six weeks. Tesla CEO Elon Musk says he's found someone to replace him as the head of Twitter. In a tweet Thursday, Musk wrote in part, Excited to announce that I have a new CEO. She will be starting in about six weeks. Musk said he will become executive chairman and chief technology officer of Twitter. 
The appointment of a successor, even an unnamed one, is likely to calm concerns of Tesla investors, who have been increasingly worried about the time Musk is devoting to turning around Twitter. Tesla's stock fell to a more than two-year low in December, with one top shareholder accusing Musk of abandoning Tesla. The stock has bounced back this year and rose 2 percent on Thursday. Musk said in November he expected to reduce his time at Twitter and eventually find a new leader to run the social media company. He has never named any candidates. The billionaire's first two weeks as the new Twitter owner in October were marked by rapid change. He quickly fired Twitter's previous CEO and other senior leaders and then laid off half its staff a month later. In a Twitter poll started by Musk in December, 57.5 percent of users voted for him to step down as CEO of the social media platform, with Musk responding, I will resign as CEO as soon as I find someone foolish enough to take the job. We're going into a short commercial break now. More news on the other side. Welcome back. As Title 42 expires, troops are now armed near the U.S.-Mexico border in preparation for a massive crowd of migrants. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is trying to combat rumors spreading on social media that the end of the restriction is a free for all. A throng of migrants lined up on the American side of the Rio Grande on Thursday along the towering border fence in El Paso, Texas, ahead of the midnight expiration of Title 42, the pandemic-era rule that allowed the U.S. to rapidly deport nearly all asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. We could see very crowded, as we are now, we could see very crowded Border Patrol facilities. In Washington, U.S. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas spoke and took questions for nearly an hour during a White House briefing on Thursday, telling reporters that authorities were seeing high numbers of border encounters and warned of tougher penalties for those who try to cross the border illegally. If anyone arrives at our southern border after midnight tonight, they will be presumed ineligible for asylum and subject to steeper consequences for unlawful entry, including a minimum five-year ban on re-entry and potential criminal prosecution. The steeper consequences are part of a new regulation rolled out by the Biden administration this week taking effect immediately after the end of Title 42 that could deny asylum to most migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border illegally. But processing the surge of applicants is expected to be, in the words of President Biden, chaotic. U.S. Customs and Border Protection has in recent days been holding up to 28,000 migrants at its facilities, far beyond its stated capacity in what appeared to be a record, according to two federal officials and the Border Patrol's union. The union's president said the busiest border detention facilities are in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas and two areas in Arizona. In Yuma, hundreds of migrants lined up before dawn at a gap in the border fence, waiting to turn themselves in to U.S. border agents. Some, including 40-year-old Giovanna Gomez from Colombia, heard about the U.S. policy change and decided to try their luck at crossing now. In my country, what we hear about immigration is that it will only be allowed until May 11th. So we came here today and we're racing against the clock. In Brownsville, Texas, migrants who had been released from federal immigration custody lined up for food provided by a local church. Some expressed confusion about the U.S. policy at the border, including Nestor Villalobos from Venezuela. We still don't understand Title 42. We don't know how it's going to be. Maybe it's easier to enter here, or maybe it's more complicated. Honestly, we are uncertain. We are here, and we do not know what will happen. Hopefully, it will be easier for us, because at the moment, it is very difficult. Now for news on the conflict in Sudan. The United Nations Human Rights Chief is urging countries that have influence in Africa to help encourage an end to the conflict, there by all possible means. With ceasefire talks between Sudan's army and the rapid support forces reportedly making progress, the United Nations is urging countries with influence in Africa to help end the conflict. Volker Turk is the UN's human rights chief. I take this opportunity to urge all states with influence in the region to encourage by all possible means the resolution of this crisis. 
Turk added that both sides in the conflict had, quote, trampled international humanitarian law. The UN Human Rights Council narrowly passed a Western-backed motion Thursday to increase monitoring of human rights abuses in Sudan. No African country voted in favor of the initiative. Ceasefire talks are taking place in the Saudi port of Jeddah, and U.S. mediators said on Wednesday they were cautiously optimistic. In public, neither side has shown it is ready to offer concessions to end the fighting. Sudan's Forces of Freedom and Change, a political group leading a plan to transfer to civilian rule, said they welcomed the talks. The priority is for silencing the sound of gunfire to address the humanitarian problem. Executive Committee member Khalid Omer Youssef told hundreds of civilians have been killed since the fighting erupted last month. Rapid advances in artificial intelligence such as OpenAI's ChatGPT are complicating government's efforts to agree to laws governing the use of the technology. Here are the latest steps international governing bodies are taking to regulate AI tools. Rapid advances in artificial intelligence such as OpenAI's ChatGPT are complicating government's efforts to agree on laws governing the use of the technology. Let's take a look at some of the recent steps national and international governing bodies are taking to regulate AI tools. In the United States, the federal government is in the process of seeking input on regulations. The Federal Trade Commission's chief says the agency is committed to using existing laws to keep in check the dangers of AI. These include enhancing the power of dominant firms and turbocharging fraud. In April, Senator Michael Bennett introduced a bill that would create a task force to look at US policies on AI and identify how best to reduce threats to privacy, civil liberties and due process. The Biden administration said it was seeking public comments on potential accountability measures for AI systems. And so tech companies have a responsibility, in my view, to make sure their products are safe before making them public. Britain says it plans to split responsibility for governing AI between its regulators for human rights, health and safety and competition, rather than creating a new body. Speaking at a business conference in April, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said governments need sovereign capability over AI to manage risks to national security. AI has the potential to transform you know, every aspect of our lives, we all know that. In April, China's cyberspace regulator unveiled draft measures to manage generative AI services. The government wants firms to submit security assessments to authorities before they launch offerings to the public. At the same time, Beijing will support leading enterprises in building AI models that can challenge chat GPT. Its Economy and Information Technology Bureau said, the European Union is considering new rules that would bolster regulations on the development and use of AI. If passed, the highly anticipated AI Act would become the world's first comprehensive legislation governing the technology. Copyrights protection is central to the bloc's effort to keep AI in check. The European Parliament will vote on the draft of the AI Act in June. Police in right gear cracked down on demonstrators who threw rocks and burnt tires in Guinea, the latest in the series of protests against the military government that seized power in 2021 and has been slow to hand power to civilians. Two people have died, doctors in Guinea's capital Conakry have said, amid clashes between police and anti-government protesters. Many were also reportedly injured in the latest in a string of protests since a 2021 military coup. On Wednesday, demonstrators threw stones and burned makeshift barricades as white clouds of tear gas drifted through the streets. Two doctors working at a city clinic said they had received two people who had died during the clashes. A police spokesperson did not confirm the deaths but said that about 20 police had been injured. A committee of opposition groups, civil society organisations and activists had called for peaceful demonstrations on Wednesday and Thursday, saying in a statement, let no one shrink from intimidation and repression. <laughs> Guinea's junta has been dragging its feet on handing power back to civilians. 
Last October, it proposed a two-year transition to elections. That was down from a three-year timeline earlier rejected by the main regional economic and political bloc, the Economic Community of West African States. Depuis le début de la transition. Many remain unimpressed, and previous protests have also proved deadly. Organizers reported the deaths of several protesters from gunshot wounds earlier this year and in 2022. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Africa has been accused of supplying Russia with arms amid its ongoing war in Ukraine. U.S. Ambassador South Africa alleged that South Africa covertly loaded weapons and ammunition into a Russian freighter in early December. The Bank of England raised its key interest rate by a quarter of a percentage point to 4.5 percent, and Governor Andrew Bailey said that the British Central Bank would stay on course as it seeks to curb the fastest inflation of any major economy. The Taiwanese metro train collided with a crane that had fallen into the tracks, resulting in one death and ten injuries. Parts of the crane boom were still dangling off the side of the elevated metro railway tracks over a busy intersection. The US Supreme Court preserved the California law banning the sale of pork into pigs kept in tightly confined spaces, rejecting an industry challenge claiming that the water-backed animal welfare measure impermissibly regulated out-of-state farmers. And that's all the news we got for you this Friday night. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end off things with a visit to the beaches of Egypt's Alexandria as participants build wonderful sandcastles in a festival in order to promote tourism. Stay safe and have a great weekend.